This moment right now is a very significant moment for me uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, First, as many of you know, uh, that there have been times in the past where it wasn't clear if Calvary Baptist Church would make it to 100 years. There were times where it seemed like this fellowship might fade away and get snuffed out altogether. I'm not sure how many times that seemed like a realistic possibility over the years. Certainly there were seasons of health and vibrancy and strength. But I know that Diane and I started attending shortly after one of these moments. I believe we were uh, couple number four under the age of 40 at the church. Uh, There were roughly 35 people uh, coming every Sunday, most of them retired and gloriously gray. Uh, 2003 and 2004 were years when the long-term future of Calvary Baptist Church was far from certain. And when Diane and I moved out here in August of 2005 for me to attend Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, we were in agreement that we wanted a church that uh, that really needed the help. (laughs) Um, We didn't want a church that was large and thriving and overflowing with, with volunteers and resources. We wanted a church where the word of God was preached, where Christ was the center, but a place that needed some help. After meeting Pastor Travis uh, Fleming and seeing the twitch he was developing from running around in a hundred different directions trying to keep uh, everything moving at the church, uh, it was clear that, that here was a place headed in the right direction, but desperately in need of some support and some encouragement. Uh, Just after a few weeks, uh, just a few weeks after our first visit, uh, Pastor Travis called me up. Um, He needed someone to fill in for a Sunday evening vintage service, is what we called it at the time, aiming uh, at some of the young adults, uh, younger people in the church. And uh, he needed someone to fill in. I was happy to help. Uh, Immediately felt welcomed and encouraged and appreciated. Diane and I quickly found kindred spirits in Travis and Melissa Fleming and Jeff and Charity Rouse, fellow transplants from the Midwest, sojourners here in New England with us. Uh, For almost two years, I juggled being uh, a full-time student and uh, helping out any way I could at the church, taught Sunday school, led a men's Bible study and accountability group, filled in for Travis on Sunday mornings or Sunday evenings, uh, played guitar and djembe in the band, though thankfully not at the same time. Um, While I couldn't see it at the time, God was preparing Diane and I for something more at Calvary. Uh, In the summer of 2007, Pastor Travis announced that he would be stepping down and uh, that their family would be moving back to the Midwest, to Illinois, where he would pursue further education. And uh, Diane and I never planned on staying long-term out here on the East Coast in New England. It was kind of our assumption that I would go to seminary, I'd finish up, and we'd head back uh, somewhere closer to home. But when Travis and Melissa left, it was clear that God had put us here for a reason. After a series of short-term pastors, the last thing that this church needed was uh, another new face, an interim pastor coming in that they'd never met, only to be followed by uh, another pastor that they'd never met. Uh, I really feel like God used Pastor Travis and Melissa to bring some life and momentum to the church. And it was clear that the church needed as much stability and consistency to maintain that momentum. So on September 1st, 2007, at the ripe old age of 26, just a little over halfway through seminary, I accepted and agreed to be the interim pastor. I wasn't convinced, <laughs> I wasn't convinced that I was the long-term uh, fit for the church yet, um, but, but it was clear that God had us, me here, 
at that moment for a reason. Uh, if you think I look young now, though, you should have seen me 11 years ago. Um, I, I, I looked so young that I knew that I needed something to help distinguish me as the pastor. And my thinking was, either I need to grow a beard or I need to wear a suit every Sunday. And, uh, and I could say that I didn't grow a beard because Diane wouldn't have liked it, but the reality is, is, is it probably would have been so spotty and ugly that it wouldn't have helped the cause any. So I settled for uh, a, a suit every Sunday for the first three or four years as pastor without fail. Uh, I, I came in a suit, though even that wasn't enough to help sometimes. I remember a funeral director once asking me if I was the pastor's son. <laughs> nope, I'm the pastor. Uh, Michelle Everdeer in the second row here is laughing. Her family called me the baby pastor. Um, but I, as I reflect on this experience, and, and, and despite my, my age and my lack of experience, the church graciously embraced me and Diane, and God never abandoned us. Balancing being a full-time pastor and a part-time student for uh, the length that I did was not easy, but God proved self-sufficient uh, over and over again as I prayed for wisdom and energy and patience and courage to be the pastor that Calvary needed. Within just a few months, uh, the search committee uh, asked if I would consider either being the long-term pastor or at least consider being the interim until I finished seminary. Um, again, I wasn't sure that I was right for the church long-term and and yet it was clear that something to help keep things stable. So I, I, I agreed to being the interim pastor while I trickled out the remainder of my classes. So that was about a two to two and a half year commitment. I said, I know I can do that. And uh, so, so I, I, I did. And um, it would be another two years before I was sufficiently convinced that, that no, God had me here for longer than that. That there was more in store uh, for the Ingersolls here at Calvary Baptist Church. And so officially in the fall of 2009, I kind of put my name into the hat and a few church business meetings later, I was uh, officially the, the pastor. Which leads me to the second reason why this moment is significant for me right now, and that is my overwhelming gratitude for the privilege of pastoring this church. Um, it's hard to put into words the role uh, this church has played in my life uh, for almost 11 years. Diane and I uh, have poured our blood, sweat, and tears into this body of believers. Uh, you've become our family, our friends, our babysitters. Uh, you've prayed for us. You've encouraged us. You've financially taken care of us. You've welcomed us into some of the most significant moments in your lives. More than 30 times I have met with couples to prepare them for marriage and stood up to declare them husband and wife. And more than 30 times I've sat at someone's bedside as they face death and speak words of comfort and hope to the grieving left behind. Like any real family, uh, it hasn't always been smooth sailing. I recognize how you've had to endure my long-windedness and my uh, annoying addiction to excessive specificity and detail. Uh, Jim Coffey has a running mental list of all the times I've walked right up to the line of what's allowable to say from the pulpit. So if you're wondering any times I've gotten close, he could probably uh, recount that for you. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly painfully aware of all of the times that, that I've let down or disappointed people along the way. But through it all, like family, you have been there for me and for Diane when we needed it. And I'm confident that I've learned far more as the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church than I ever did in seminary. So thank you. Uh, before I turn to the passage that I want to look at with you this morning, uh, allow me to mention one more reason why this moment is significant for me. 
And that is that the timing has worked out such, it wasn't the plan, but the timing has worked out such that today is my last sermon as the senior pastor of Calvary Baptist Church. Now, many of you know that I announced earlier this year that I would be stepping down as pastor in order to pursue starting a website and business to provide uh, better preaching resources for pastors. It's a vision that uh, I've had for several years and haven't been able to shake and just feel like I need to risk it and give it a shot and see what God uh, does with it. Uh, sermonwise.com. It's not up yet. Don't go there. But in the months to come, my prayer is that God will turn that into something that blesses pastors and churches around the world. Um, the timing of my last sermon being today and this centennial weekend has unexpectedly made this moment feel more like a wedding than I expected. Um, I have a seven-year-old daughter, Jillian, and uh, I, I look forward to the day when I might be able to walk her down the aisle and release her to someone else to kind of let go of my primary role of leading and protecting her and entrust her to another. And there's a sense in which this moment with the preparation and all of the, 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 the pomp and everything that goes into a weekend like this feels a little bit, to me at least, like a wedding. And I'm walking Calvary Baptist Church down the aisle and entrusting this church not only to the elders and interim pastor, but, but ultimately it's entrusting the church where it's always been to God, who's been faithful for a hundred years, and God who will be faithful for, I pray, for a hundred more. And so this weekend, at least so far, has been about kind of primarily looking back, reflecting, remembering, rejoicing in God's past goodness that has gotten us to this point, but it's appropriate before this weekend is up to look forward to the future with hope and joy and confidence, knowing that the God who started this work will be faithful to complete it. So towards that end, as we look to the future, as we look to what God might want to do in the years to come, I want to turn our attention to the Word of God, to Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 3, it's, it's Paul's prayer for this church that he founded, that he pastored, that he poured himself out to, and now in writing them a letter, he prays for them. And as we linger on this, I mean, if, if you're not familiar with this passage, this passage is, in my opinion, one of the mountain peaks of Scripture. He prays for the Ephesians to, to not have a shallow superficial relationship with Christ, but to be intimately connected to Christ, to be thoroughly rooted in the love of Christ, to be completely transformed by Christ. This is a great prayer for us in this moment because it might be tempting after a week of celebrations and nostalgic moments to leave merely feeling something along the lines of, wow, wasn't that a nice weekend? Or perhaps, uh, wow, God has really been good to us over the last hundred years. But those are not bad sentiments. It's been a great weekend, and God has been good to us for the last hundred years. But anything good we've experienced up until this point as a church is merely a taste and a glimpse of the very goodness of God himself and there is so much yet to experience. There is no reason for us to ever get to a point where we've said, I've had enough. That's, that's enough of God. That's enough of his grace. That that's all I need of his nearness or his power at work in my life. I pray that anything we've experienced till now merely whets our appetite for how much more there is, how, the, the depth to be plumbed, the, the, the joy to be experienced, the hope that we can cling to. There is so much more for us. And Paul prays for the Ephesians. And, and, and we're going to turn this and, and I, I hope pray this for one another that God would do this work in us. 
that God would give us a hunger and a thirst for more of him, that we wouldn't settle merely for what we've attained so far, for the level of knowledge we've had so far, for the level of intimacy we've had so far, but we would say, God, take me deeper, draw me closer, change me even more. So I want to start with Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. And here Paul says, he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father. I want to pause right at the beginning here. I can't skip over, as a pastor, I can't skip over phrases like this. For this reason, I kneel before, well, for what reason? What are you talking about, Paul? Um, Before we see what Paul prayed, we need to understand why Paul prayed. What compelled Paul? Because he already, in chapter one, he prayed for the Ephesians. As he keeps writing, what compels him to press pause in the middle of his letter and pray for them yet again? There's two verses that most clearly explain why Paul paused to pray for the Ephesians again. Um, You'll see, actually, if you glance back at chapter 3, verse 1, that Paul almost started his prayer then. Kind of like me, where I start a sentence and then kind of interrupt myself and go on a tangent. Trying to be like Paul. Um, If you look at chapter 3, verse 1, he says, For this reason, I, Paul... The prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. And then you'll see at least most translations have a little dash there. Which is the translator's way of saying, Paul never finishes this sentence. Like, he, for this reason I, Paul, prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Well, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given me. Paul interrupts himself to remind them of his apostolic role in explaining the mysteries of Christ to them. And he wants to just pause to kind of reiterate that. So he interrupts himself from praying, and he gets back to it again in verse 14, for this reason. So so what's this reason that almost makes him jump into it in verse 1, and then uh, makes him jump into it in verse 14? Uh, We see it, this reason given in two places. Uh, First in chapter 2, verse 18. And there Paul says, he says, For through him, that is Christ, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. In chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul is talking about how Jews and Gentiles together have access to God because of what Christ has done. And, And these Ephesians were primarily Gentiles. They were primarily outside Uh, They were kind of on the outside looking in. The promises of God were for the God's people, the Jews, not for them. They were they were without hope, without God in the world, is is the way that he phrases it in chapter two, verse thirteen, or sorry, uh, verse twelve, I believe. Yeah, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near. By the blood of Christ. Jew, Gentile, whatever your background, because of Jesus Christ, we have access as children to a father to go directly before the throne of God. That that compels him, that stirs him. You know, we've been given this privilege. What a I can't let this privilege go. I've got to pray. And so he he almost starts in verse one. Gets on a little bit of a tangent, unpacking again and kind of reminding them why uh, this is important and this privilege of how God has used him to explain um, this unity we have in and through Christ and the gospel. And so then in verse, uh, chapter uh, 3, verse uh, 12, he he reiterates his point again. Chapter 3, verse 12, in him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. My children don't cower in fear, afraid to talk to me. They're not afraid to say, Daddy, Daddy, can I have some help? They know that as a loving father, they have my ear. They can come to me anytime. God, through Christ, has made that privilege possible to us. And Paul says, let's not waste that privilege. Let's go. And so he he prays, he draws near to God. And this is what we uh, what we see as he, as he prays, he prays in verses, four, uh, in, in, we'll start at verse 14 and we'll, we'll go up to verse 16. For this reason I kneel before the Father, 
from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. I I want us to to think about this for a minute. Here we get Paul's first request. We're going to see two main requests, one ultimate purpose that he's wanting to see accomplished. And in this first request, well, both requests are requests for power. They're they're prayers for supernatural divine enablement, supernatural strength. In verse 16, he prays that they would have power to embrace Christ's nearness. And in verse 18, he's praying that they would have power to comprehend Christ's love. Two prayers for power, power to embrace Christ's nearness and power to comprehend Christ's Christ's love. Let me, I want to show you verse 16 because it's not immediately obvious that he's praying that they would have power to embrace Christ's nearness. Let's see that together. Verse 16, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. At first glance, it might seem strange for Paul, writing to a church filled with Christians. Uh, he, he's written already. He has confidence that they're saved. They're going to heaven. He's confident that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in them. So, so why is Paul praying that Christ may dwell in them? Since presumably Christ is already dwelling in them. The answer to that question is found when you understand the Greek word dwell. It's, it's, it has more meaning than most English translations can convey. Uh, the word dwell here, he, he's, he's not merely praying that Christ would be present, but that Christ would settle down and make his home there. The word means to, like, to, to, to get yourself comfortable, to get settled in as if it's your home. When visitors come over, uh, we often say make yourself at home. I'd imagine many of you have said, oh, make yourself at home. And what we mean is, don't simply stand around awkwardly, afraid to touch anything. Get comfortable. Be, be, be natural. Feel, feel at home here. Live as if this were your home. Now, technically, I've never met anyone who actually means that. <laughs> when you say, make yourself at home, we mean, you know, relax a little bit. But we don't really mean, live like this is your home. You know, uh, how, how would you feel if a friend came over to stay in your guest bedroom. I I doubt that you would want them to rearrange the furniture, hang pictures on your wall, you do structural changes to your closet, you know, the kinds of things that you would do if it's your home. You say, well, don't go that far. You know, be be, be welcome, but don't really act like it's your, your home. But that's just it. There's a difference between living somewhere as a visitor and making something your home. And Paul is talking about Christ making his home in us, living in us, not as a visitor, not as a guest who's welcome, but who can't touch anything, but dwelling and settling down and messing things up, turning things upside down, rearranging things and reorienting things so that he is truly at home in our hearts. And we need, Paul prays for supernatural strength that Christ might do that because we need help to embrace Christ's nearness. It is not an easy, comfortable experience. I'd imagine many of us have had uh, house guests who've needed to stay for an extended period of time. Does that test your patience? You know, you wouldn't say it necessarily to them, but maybe husband and wife, you're like, When are they going to go? Like, can we get through this thing here? I mean, of course, Diane and I have never felt that. I'm trying to think if anyone here has stayed in our home. Michael in the front row. um. Anyways, uh, (laughs) you you know the point I'm making, that anytime someone stays for an extended period of time, it it tests things. It it stretches things. Uh, How much more so if they start moving everything around and making changes? Would that drive you nuts? I suspect that it would. A number of years ago, before we had kids, uh, there was a, late October, there was a lady who we discovered was living in her car across the street from the church. 
And uh, Diane and I went out there. It was getting too cold at night. When we realized what was going on, we uh, welcomed her into our guest bedroom. And she lived with us for a couple of months. And, uh, you know, she, uh, she was nice. She was appreciative. <laughs> But she couldn't help wanting to rearrange everything. She couldn't help. I mean, it was, it was, it was a strange dynamic for a little while. Um, she, she wanted to improve our home in ways that she thought were best, especially our kitchen, which is kind of Diane, where Diane truly feels at home. And Diane's a pretty patient and understanding person. I mean, she's been married to me for 14 years, so that says something. Um, but she reached the limit of what she could handle. The situation was not working. Something needed to happen. It is not an easy thing when someone comes into your home and starts living like it's their home. And yet, that's exactly what Christ Jesus wants to do for us. He wants to not just be visitors in our hearts. He wants to dwell in us. He wants to make a home there. And everything that's out of sync with him Everything that's out of line, everything that doesn't fit well with him, he wants to clean it up. He wants to throw it out. He wants to rearrange it so that your heart, your mind, your thoughts, your habits, your choices all begin to get aligned so that we're in sync with Jesus Christ, wanting what he wants, loving what he loves, doing what he does. That is not an easy thing to experience. And Paul prays for the Ephesians that God would supernaturally, by his Holy Spirit, strengthen and enable them to not merely let this happen, but to embrace and to want Christ coming and messing everything up, changing everything around, that he would truly dwell in us. So Paul's prayer is that when Christ draws near, um, that, that, that he would change everything, that we'd, that we'd have power to embrace that. And then he continues. He has a second prayer for power. Not only does he want Christ to, to draw near, make himself at home in our lives, but he prays that we would have power to comprehend Christ's love. To comprehend Christ's love. Uh, look at the second half of verse 17. He says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Here we see, when you look at verses 16 and 17 and then 17 to 19, we see two prayer requests. A prayer for power to embrace Christ's nearness and then a power to understand and comprehend his love. How are these connected? I spent a good bit of time wrestling with this uh, this week. What's the connection between these two requests? And, and I believe they're sequential. I believe he prays the first prayer in order that the second prayer might be possible. So he prays that we would have supernatural, spiritual power to embrace the, the, the change, Christ dwelling in our hearts. And then, notice that he doesn't pray that we would be rooted and established in love, but he assumes that we will be, at that point, rooted and established in love. If Christ draws near and makes himself at home in our hearts, then we will be rooted and established in love. When Christ dwells in us, we are by definition rooted in him. This is in part why this weekend's theme is rooted in Christ. Hopefully you've seen it all over on logos and things like that leading up to this weekend. Um, rooted in Christ. Technically this passage says rooted in love, and yet our theme has been rooted in Christ. And, and that's deliberate because... Because this love that we are rooted in is the love of Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's as we have Christ saturating and taking up every part of our lives that like a tree with, with roots going down into the soil, we find ourselves finding our nourishment from him, finding our sustenance and our strength from him. Like a building with 
foundations going down into unshakable rock, when Christ is dwelling in us, we are anchored. We are grounded. We are standing on firm footing, solid ground. And so Paul's prayer is that when Christ draws near, make him, makes himself at home in our lives and brings everything into alignment with him so that we're grounded on his love, drawing our nourishment from his love, then out of that being saturated, rooted, grounded in his love as he takes over every part of us, then he prays that we might have more power to grasp the immensity of the love of Christ. To, to, to get a grip on its height and depth and width and breadth. And here Paul knowingly p- prays an impossible prayer. He prays that we would have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is Christ, to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Isn't that a strange sentence? To know this love that surpasses knowledge. I, just, I pray that you would know this thing that you really can't fully know. And the reason Paul prays that is because no matter how much you know of Christ's love, there is more still to know. No matter how deep your roots have gone, there is deeper still with more love that you can tap into and draw from. No matter how much and no matter how close he's draw, that you've drawn to him and he's drawn to you, no matter how close, there is a closer still that is possible for you and Paul is praying for this church that they would not settle for anything less than the very fullness of God filling all of them which is the ultimate purpose we see at the end of verse 19 we would know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God do you want that do you want that for your life And do you want that for Calvary Baptist Church? I pray that we would be a people that don't settle for how close we are, how much we know, how much joy there is in our life. I pray that we would be a people moving forward, that this church would be characterized as a church that continues to hunger and thirst day after day, year after year, for more of Christ, for more nearness, for more intimacy, for more power, for more joy. God has been good for the last hundred years, but we have not reached the end. We have not tapped the fullness of what is possible. There is more waiting for us. And though it seems impossible, nothing is impossible with God, which is why Paul ends with this incredible doxology. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And just think of how many adjectives Paul piles up there. He could have just said, to him who can do what we imagine. Well, to him who can do more than we imagine. To him who can do immeasurably more than we imagine. To him who can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Like he just piles it up. He can do beyond what we can think, beyond what we can imagine, beyond what we can dream. He can do that according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. May we as a church never stop going deeper. May we never keep Jesus at arm's length saying, don't come any closer. I'm kind of good with the way that things are now. I pray that you'd never say that personally in your lives because I'd imagine there are some parts of your lives you'd rather not change. Some relationships you'd rather not rearrange or set new habits in. Some, you know, it, it's just, we get in ruts. Don't keep Jesus at arm's length saying, don't touch this. This closet, this is off limits. It's locked. Don't touch anything in there. Don't do that in your lives and I pray that as a church, that nothing would be off limits for us as a church. If God wants to rearrange, the, what, what makes Calvary Baptist Church a healthy church is not that we look like what we looked like 50 years ago or 75 years ago or 100 years ago because I would imagine that if you could see us in 2018 versus 1918, we are drastically different churches, right? And yet, 
the gospel hasn't changed. The love of Christ hasn't changed. The, the, the way that ministry takes shape will change, and it ought to change, and we should never say, God, don't touch this thing, don't touch that thing. As a church, I pray that our posture is saying, God, whatever you want, we are yours change our plans, rearrange things, take us in new directions if that's your will. We just want more of you. We just want to know you better. We just want to honor you more. We just want more joy, your joy filling us. I pray that we would continue to pray this prayer for one another in the years to come. Let's pray. Father God, Thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your patience, your grace, and your forgiveness for overcoming my faults and shortcomings and weaknesses over the last 11 years, for overcoming our shortcomings and faults and weaknesses for the last 100 years. Thank you for never abandoning us. Thank you. Thank you that you continue as a loving Father to freely welcome us and invite us that we could have your ear, that we could draw near to your throne, that we could sit at your feet. God, fill us with a hunger and a thirst for more, that we would never settle, but, but draw closer and grip tighter and dig deeper, that we would be filled to the fullness with, with the whole measure of God. In your name we pray. Amen.